Name something comparable to the pop culture phenomenon of child stardom. I mean, you were you were a mature six when you made the film. I mean, had you had a lot of, of acting experience before that? Yeah, um, I had done one feature film, um, maybe three or four TV movies, and about 20 commercials. When, so. How old were you when you started? I was 11 months when I started. <laughs> From Kentwood, Louisiana, here is 10-year-old Britney Spears. Next, we have contestant number 122, Justin Timberlake. How old were you when you first had alcohol? Nine. I noticed last week you had the most adorable, pretty eyes. Do you have a boyfriend? No, sir. Why not? They're mean. <laughs> Boyfriends? You mean all boys are mean? I'm not mean. How about me? Well, it depends. I get that a lot. Um, now, you grew up on a farm. Abominable snowman. Maybe it's the footprints of the abominable snowman. You have to do it over. Maybe it's the footprints of the abominable snowman and over of the abominable snowman and over and over again maybe it's a footprint of the abominable snowman good cut to be able to be such an exaggerated character of a child a dinosaur you've got to be able to make people grown people in suits that make zillions of dollars Believe your kid. Quiet. Everyone not involved in the shot is out of the shot. We were working in an adult environment and more or less expected to behave like adults. It's not fiddly dee, fiddly doo dee dee um, or anything like that. It's not fun. It's not a playground. You have to work. And then, well, how did you start to drink? So the usual way somebody said, have a drink at this. Right. Um, well, I had grown up very fast, and it's not very normal to see a nine-year-old at a big Hollywood party drinking. And um, it looks a little weird, and people were laughing and just saying, you know, I dare you to do this, and I did. And I got really drunk, and it was such a scary, frightening feeling, yet it was such an escape from everything else in the world that I became, I had a very liking to it. And. Um, What about the drugs? That started when I was about 10 and 11, and, um... Who, who gave you your first drug, for goodness sake? Um, as I said then, they were friends, but they weren't really friends. And, um, to me, it just seemed normal. All the people I were around did it, and I thought it was a way of life that was just normal to be living. Four, three, two, one. Yeah, Channel Zero with a little bow wow. How you doing? Look at her. She's so cute. Girl, you so... Hey. Are you... Uh, are you for... Oh, he is... He, he dope. Hey, what's up with you, man? Nothing. Hey, you got, you got the freestyle flows, man? Yeah. Hey, let me, let me hear a little something first. Let me hear a little something. But I mean, with the... The people you were around weren't the same age as you, they weren't. No, I always had older friends. I was always with a much very advanced older crowd from when I was about six. Let's tell you, I've been reading your book the last couple of days, and I'm very much impressed. Let me tell you that. Because after reading it, I thought, what the hell did they do to you? What the hell did your father do to you? He abused you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> This lady has so much heart. This lady has more heart than Jordan and Johnson put together. 
When she steps on the stage, uh, you know there's there's a lot of future there. Please welcome. Oh, oh, really? That's even more amazing. Ten-year-old Amanda Burns. <laughs> well, as you know from reading the book, there was a lot of abuse in the family. There was not only physical and emotional abuse, but there was also sexual abuse. And I think this is something that needs to be addressed to the world, to the public, to let people know that sexual abuse is wrong, and we should put a stop to it. My father was a very abusive person, and I think he didn't know how to control it, or he didn't know what or did realize he what he was doing. He did lots of things. He would beat us constantly. He would take guns and put them to our heads and pull the trigger all the time until the day I left home. He would take matches and burn our toes and he would laugh and we couldn't do anything because if you would say no or whatever when you were asleep and he's burning your toes, he would beat you. So you'd have to stay there and just take the pain and not do anything. person with a big voice and an even bigger dream from Detroit, Michigan, welcome 10 year old Aaliyah Hutton. Thank you, Aaliyah. Two worthy performances. Now, while the old, why didn't you? Oh, I was twenty nine, yes. Yeah, very why didn't you get time. out of the house? Sooner. I made several attempts to leave, and you know you can ask me this question. Yes, of course, I made several attempts to leave, but I never, I never could leave because my father would always say, "Wherever you go, I'm going to find you and bring you back home." And my mother was sort of like the silent partner, and she would always say, "But it's not good for you to be out there alone. You're a girl, and someone can follow you and follow you home, and it's very dangerous." More than often, I think Puffy would say, "Man, you got to chill. Like you're just a little bit too intense. You know, you got to relax. Like, yo, man, I'm here to work, man. I ain't saying in a week." I mean, I'm 13 years old, like banging on this man as though, <laughs> you know, I am the manager. I am the spokesperson for Usher. And I'm telling him, look, you're going to put me in the studio, man. You got Biggie Smalls in there. You got Craig Mack in there. You're going to make me a priority, too. I'm not here to party with you. I don't want to go to the clubs. I'm, matter of fact, I'm too young to even be in here. Why you got me in clubs? Of all of E.T.'s kids, Drew has met with the most success since the movie. She's yeah. Since when? Eleven, ten months old. At ten months old, what happened at ten months old that made you know you wanted to be an actor? I just said to my mom, I want to be an actor. And she said, no, no, honey, that's fine. That's okay, you know, it's really hard work. So you could just go out back into bed and take a nappy. And then I said, no, I want to, I want to be an actress. And she said, all right. <clears throat> so she took me to an agent about when I was 11 months old. It was a commercial for um, Puppy Chow. Set where you would go in order to be the filthy mouth <laughs> individual, because of course we can't say most of the words that are in this book. I think as a kid I realized, hey look, that's not my ring, that's not my moment, that's not my bottle, that's not my drink, that's not my celebration. So I'm not here to celebrate. I wanted people to be excited about me the way that they were excited about him. I wanted my own success. So, I would stay at the studio. I just, I just, fresh off the garden stage. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the Frosted Flakes, you know what I'm saying, before pause was invented, you know what I'm saying, but it's my brother for real, we used to actually wrestle off of the, off of the Frosted Flakes because he used to always get up early with me, and now he's one of the richest stars in the world, and I'm Yo, like, what the fuck did Puff just say? 
Nobody's going to acknowledge this but me. Puff Giuseppe used to wrestle over the Frosted Flakes. And we're streaming live. That was stupid. Listen, that was fucking stupid. Listen, we're having a good time. Listen, yo, are you usher made in the Hey, yo. But as so you asked me that question, way, oh, you? everybody, I was basically next to the last to leave home. Michael left home one week after I did. And you could say, why did he stay? He could have left as well, but he didn't. He not only did terrible things to you with matches and things like that, but he also sexually abused you. Yes. You want to talk about that? Yes, I, I don't want to get graphic with it, but yes, it was, uh, it was quite terrible. He would abuse my sister. We slept in the same bed, and he would sexually abuse her. He would come into the bed constantly, and I was right there in the same bed. And my mother would allow it to happen. She would say to him sometimes, Joe, not tonight. She's tired. Don't bother her. And I would be right there in the bed, and I would keep the covers over my head because I would hear my sister fighting and screaming. And she asked my mother to go to a psychiatrist and get a psychiatrist for him, but she said no. Not at all. So my sister left home at a very young age, and when she left home, then my father started sexually abusing me. The question many are asking this morning about Easy A star Amanda Bynes. You want to live here in Manhattan now, in a series of bizarre tweets over the weekend following her arrest that landed her in front of a judge on Friday, writing, I know cops cannot illegally enter my apartment, sexually harass me, arrest me, take me to a mental hospital, then lock me up for a crime I didn't commit. I'm suing them all for this upsetting nightmare. Seven years old was charged with criminal possession of marijuana, tampering with physical evidence and reckless endangerment. After police claim she threw a bong out of her 36-story apartment window in New York late Thursday night. The NYPD denies Bynes' claim of sexual harassment, but are investigating the matter. Suing her family for money laundering and even attacked singer Rihanna, reportedly tweeting and quickly deleting a string of vicious insults against the pop superstar. Most recently writing, I am allergic to marijuana and alcohol, but I smoke tobacco. Why does Rihanna smoke weed and not get in trouble for it? But I smoke tobacco and people think I'm on drugs. In response, a single tweet from Rihanna, quote, you see what happens when they cancel intervention? The once fresh-faced Hollywood starlet, seen with a sheared haircut in her latest mugshot, has emerged from her apartment to reportedly shop for a brand new wig. And despite her turbulent week, denied anything was wrong. That mentally, it's not good for you because you live with this anger and this fear inside of you, and it's not healthy for your system. So I think anybody who's ever been abused should speak out and let people know that you're being abused because eventually, what the abuser doesn't know is eventually... That person that they're abusing is going to tell on you sooner or later. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but eventually that person will speak out and say, this person abused me. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Well, start from the top. The top. intros. Yeah. Yeah, okay. What's up, y'all? I'm J. Book. What's cracking, y'all? I'm Raz B. Yo, what's up? I'm Lil Fizz. Yo, what up? I'm Marion. And, and we're, we're B2K. B2K. So, from the Los Angeles area? Yeah, everybody from California. California. So how did you actually, you know, tell us the B2K story. You guys uh, did a showcase for Epic Records in Los Angeles, and that's how you got discovered. But what were you doing before then? Before, before B2K came together. All right, B2K, we, all, we were put together uh, by past managers, and uh, Chris Stokes was our manager now. And how it all came about was Lil Fizz, Raz B, and me. We were um, put together when we were like 12 and 13. Yeah. Yeah. And from there, Chris took over the whole project, and he brought Omarion into the group, which is Batman's little brother from IMX, which is the other group he manages. And from there, we just been like brothers. There are a lot of grown women out there who are afraid to speak up and who are embarrassed, and they need to talk about it. We, this is a subject that's so taboo that we don't want to talk about it, but we need to open up and let the world know that you've been abused so we can put a stop to this, because it's very unfair to do that to people. How did you feel? If you you must have felt, they must have made you feel good. Yeah, it did. It was um, that great escape that you look for when you're younger, or any, actually at any age in your lifetime, you look for that escape to get away from your problems in life. And when you do drugs, your problems in normal life seem so much bigger that you just, you know, you kind of do more just to get away from them. Has it been like what you thought it was going to be, Chris? At all? Nah. It's cool. It's cool to us. You know, it's we like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's fun, but is it like, like when you were growing up? Well, you still are growing up, but when you were growing up and you saw other famous people, you sort of had an idea of what it was like. So is it like that? Does it feel like that? You know, really, when we saw 
famous people, we thought that they was having fun every, all the time and everything, and there wasn't ever no pressure on them because they was making money and they was getting all the fans selling records. But it's not like that. I read and fun because I actually spilled apple juice all over my my outfit. That was fun. Next time I'm going to dump it all over you, Ashley. By 6.30 at night, the twins were allowed to kick off their shoes and relax for this CNN interview. In Los Angeles, where child oh, TikTok. Is there any time that you wish, oh, I wish I was just a regular, normal child who doesn't work? No. No. What do people say to you when they come up to you? Can I have your autograph? Can I have your autograph? Take a picture. It's kind of, it's a down, complete downhill. It's a spiral. complete downhill cycle that you just get caught up into and... Either you make it out or you don't, and it's, it's very scary. And you went for the treatment, but it, that, took, that you had setbacks, and you? You did some crazy things when you came out of treatment. Yeah, I did. Um, at, at first I was clean, but I, you know, I was off drugs, but I still had the same behavior and was still doing the same things. got on that stage it was like a different Beyonce and I looked at Tina and Tina looked at me and was like is that Beyonce I can't believe that's her it's just amazing you know seeing this And all these hoes laughing like so funny. She's talking about the audience, that they're laughing at her. Did, did you say the, the, the hoes are laughing? Yep. So the audience are a bunch of hoes? Yep. Catch me outside, how about that? Huh? Catch me outside, how about that? Actually, the message is to all young people, don't do it. To however young you are, you can fall into these traps. Is there any one rule that you'd say or anything that you'd say to parents? Um, well, that whole just, I mean, you can't just say, just say no, because it doesn't, they don't listen. I didn't listen, and, and other friends of mine didn't listen. You have to really understand where your kid is coming from, from a parent, and you have to let go and um, turn it over to, a, like, either a higher power, whatever you believe in, and have a lot of patience and understanding and really help your kid. <clears throat> and for the kids, it really depends on the individual because everybody is different and everybody needs a certain different type of help to get through their problem. And hopefully they can find the right one and really stick with it and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of understanding. Those who closely followed the Ramsey case now wait to see if any of this connects him to the murder of the six-year-old beauty queen. Gregarious, she's always going to put on a show and entertain you.
They're all talking about a singing group called Immature. Although this trio of 13-year-old performers is anything but, they've grown immensely since the release of their 1993 debut album. In order to distance themselves from rappers, they've adopted a new, mellow, rhythm and blues style. I caught up with Jerome Jones, known as Romeo, Kelton Kesey, he's LDB, and Marcus Batman Houston in their hometown of Los Angeles on the back lot of Universal Studios Hollywood. You three are 13, have a hit record, and you're being mobbed by fame. Well, I, I got my nickname because one time we were in New Orleans and I started playing with Batman underwear on my head. <laughs> <laughs> and my manager thought it was a good idea and I was like, uh -uh. Were you and, that much of a fan of Batman? Yeah, I, I always liked Batman. But, <laughs> and then uh, I ended up work, wearing it over a hat. And every time somebody asked my name, I just go like this and say, Batman, <laughs> yep. And that's why I got mine. Yeah. And LDB stand, stands for Little Drummer Boy. Yeah, I got my name because when I was a little boy, I used to play the drums since I was two. Mm -hmm. So when I got in the group Immature, Chris named me LDB. So that's how I got my name. I got mine from the fans because they thought I was like Little Romeo. So I took that in and started calling myself Romeo. Yes. Who's the slick one in the group and, who, and who's the shy one with the girls? Well, well, we all probably the same girl. Yeah. yeah. Romeo is like the slick one. Yeah, he is. I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> While they rarely give interviews or make appearances these days, the former child stars did previously share a video for Ashley Benson's birthday back in 2019. Happy birthday, Ashley. I hope this year is one of the best ones yet. We're sending Super you lots of love. Super magical and can't wait to meet you soon. Individuals. Okay, they were just babies. We all know when they made their television debut, remember? Little Michelle. <laughs> We all remember Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen as Michelle Tanner on the popular sitcom Full House. They grew up right before our eyes. These pint-sized powerhouses struck gold when they traveled the world starring in their own series of home video adventures. Welcome to Roma. With the launch of their production company, Dual Star Entertainment, at age seven, Mary Kay and Ashley became the youngest producers in Hollywood. Just a since then, they've made nearly 30 videos and recorded 10 albums. And that's not all. From a magazine, books, clothes, cosmetics, even their own dolls, the Olsen twins are cashing in big. This dynamic duo is headed off to college this fall, but that hasn't slowed them down. Insiders predict they'll be billionaires before they can even vote. Mary Kate and Ashley are not a flash in the pan. They're not an overnight success. They've been working hard for 17 years. June 13th is our birthday, and we officially become, you know, presidents of our company, Dual Star. June 13th, you take over the presidential reigns as 18-year-olds. Yeah, I mean, we've been acting. Presidents. In that. <laughs> we've been acting, you know, as that, presidents. As presidents for, you know, since we've been doing this whole thing. But um, I guess, yeah, legally, we get the name. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, at you, how old are you now? Fif I'm 15, almost 15. 16. And you're just living a day at a time? Yes. One minute, one moment. Team peaks and valleys of global fame, hidden medical hospitalizations, artistic milestones, rapid adultification, and multi-layered abuse I wish on no one. I narrowly survived the toddler to train wreck pipeline. In fact, nothing was designed for me to end up normal, stable, alive. The toddler to train wreck pipeline is a notorious and thriving industrial complex around child entertainers. It was first documented in 1885 when Elsie Leslie made her theatrical debut at four years old, becoming an American celebrity at six. Since then, a full-fledged system has emerged. It's expertly constructed and it's bolted in place by censoring the harm happening behind the scenes, manicuring aspirational lifestyles and outcomes, and then watching young lives tragically implode. You may recognize the pipeline by specific press campaigns like Shocking Rebellion or Miraculous Comeback. It prophesies pitiful and shameful fates for little tots with big talent while conveniently remaining in denial of its own violent blueprint. 
Instead, the damage manifests as illness or questionable behavior and gets projected onto the child as if they are an isolated problem. Now, this does not dismiss their personal responsibility or negate the positives and privileges that accompany the spotlight. Simply, the records are consistent. How can children unwittingly copy and paste the same horror stories, cries for help, and humiliating spirals? How come there have been no signs of improvement for centuries? As someone who lived it and witnessed thousands endure alongside me, I can attest that what is missing from the pipeline narrative are clear action plans for intervention, long-term prevention, and accountability from studios, agencies, and guardians. On behalf of the current children being abused right now, there is an opportunity for us to empower each other through honest conversation and collaborative action. Knowing Macaulay Culkin, he made sure, he schemed on me. He told me to go up on the diving board and I went up there like a nut. I dried off, they pushed me right back in. <laughs> Mac is the most reckless driver, oh my god. Now, me and I got you on real quick. I know we gotta like, you know about all the rumors about you being married and stuff like that. Was there any truth to that? Man, you are so late. I'm, I know, but you know what it is? You it's like, so late. It, 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 I just had to ask it though. Nah, because like the fans, they know. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like my fans, that I love you. Thank you for supporting me. They know. Like you need to get like an old vibe or something, and like <laughs> right. get the answer because that's old. I'm single. Okay. Go with a dime.